Hello, I'm Henry Fosdyke, Content Manager for Symphony AI's Financial Services Division. I want to warmly welcome you to this exciting webinar, Gen AI and Risk, FinCrime FAQs Discussed by Experts. I want to get straight into the discussion, but before we do, just a few bits of housekeeping to cover. All attendees have been muted. The webinar will run for 45 minutes and including your questions, and today's session will be recorded and available for playback later. To ask a question during the webinar, please do use the chat function, not the Q&A tab, as it isn't accessible to everyone. And I will be selecting the questions most relevant and pertinent to our discussion today. Feel free to learn more about anything we do discuss by contacting us using the QR code at the end of the session. And if we don't reach your question, then we will endeavor to follow up via email afterwards. Okay, then that's enough from me. I now wish to introduce you to our two experts today. First is Charmaine Simmons, a financial crime and compliance expert in Symphony AI's financial services division covering the EMEA region. She has over 20 years of experience in the financial sector across risk management, financial crime, internal controls, and IT advisory. She is responsible for providing practitioner expertise, thought leadership, and analyzing key policy, regulatory, and technology drivers transforming the compliance market. We're also very pleased to welcome Becky Laporte, a strategic advisor in the fraud and AML practice at Datos Insights, covering anti-money laundering, know your customer and sanctions matters. Becky brings nearly 25 years of financial crime compliance and business experience, including conducting investigations, developing and delivering comprehensive training and consulting on program design, development and implementation. Becky supports firms of all sizes across a wide spectrum of financial, of financial crimes compliance matters and also serves as a member of the ACFCS advisory board. So we are in good hands. Without further ado, I shall hand over to Charmaine and Becky to kick us off. Great, thank you so much, Henry. Welcome everybody. This is a topic that we are really excited to uh, talk to you about today. It's one of the things that I guess Becky and I are a little bit passionate about, something we get asked a lot uh, very frequently um, from multiple different um, banking institutions, insurance companies and corporates. So let me sort of just start to set the scene for you a little bit. What, what one of the first questions that we get asked about is, well, what is AI when we're talking about AI? And I guess that's the first real clue for me is to sit there and say, well, the first thing we're really wanting to talk to you about is the difference between predictive AI and generative AI. Now, when we're talking about predictive AI, what we're really trying to um, uncover is some of the newer style, um, I guess, machine learning techniques that are available today that use um, either semi-supervised, supervised and unsupervised uh, machine learning techniques. A lot of those are very useful when it comes to doing um, data analysis type techniques, forecasting, um, identifying potential instances of maybe activity or fraudulent behaviour. Those um, types of machine learning um, techniques can leverage historical um, data patterns, you know, transactional information. They can look at how they can proactively assess and really predict what we're seeing with some of the future um, type of transactions that are coming through, whether it's really high volume or whether it's something very, very intricate. So that's sort of one side of predictive AI. The second side of generative AI, which is really going to be the focus of today's session, is sort of much newer in terms of its techniques, uh, but one that's really around generating new and original um, data and content. And I'd be surprised if many of you, if not all of you, have probably used some form of generative AI at this point in time, whether it's through a web browser, whether it's through an app, you've probably engaged it at some point. Now, those type of um, generative um, techniques use large language models, so LLMs, and they use large action models, LAMs. And really the, the underlying principle of those is to learn the patterns and the structures that happen within those data sets as existing data. So it can be used basically to create new knowledge, new data, new content, um, and therefore make it really easier um, to consume overall. So that's sort of where we're gonna sort of focus in on, on today's um, session the most. That's just laying a bit of the, the, the ground rules, but Henry, can we come back into you and see what we might be able to do around um, some of the FAQs that we're always asked? Perfect, yeah. So we thought we'd begin with a few common questions that Charmaine and Becky often hear before turning to those questions that came in ahead of time during registration, alongside any questions that come in via the chat. Uh, so to kick us off, uh, what stops criminals from using generative AI to perpetrate their crimes? And how can the banking industry stop it 
if the internal due diligence, transformation and control presses, processes are onerous. Becky, do you want to stop? Oh, sure. So nothing is really stopping criminals from using AI, if, if we're being honest. Um, we, on the financial industry side, have rules that we have to follow and regulations and processes, and they don't. So they can wake up in the morning, come up with an idea, and then implement it. Um, and we're seeing it in a lot of different ways. We're seeing it in you know, deep fakes. We're seeing it in using you know the spam and the scams. The, the language is getting better, so we're not picking it up right away because they're able to generate really good language when they're reaching out to us. Um, and there's, there's a lot of other different ways that they're doing it. Um, it's a great way for them to sort of find their victim, per se. So they're going out and they're finding people that are interacting more quickly uh, with those types of, of scams and things of that nature. Um, how do we put controls in place? Uh, it's challenging, for sure. Uh, it's We're doing it, though, and having really good technology can help you do that. It's very hard to stay in front of that in a manual perspective. So making sure that you have the right technology that can help you catch those types of things quickly and can adjust. Um, doing things manually, sometimes it's hard to turn on a dime and adjust really quickly. So this way, with some type of generative AI or even the predictive AI, you can sort of figure out what's going on from a technology standpoint and adjust to that. Um, one other thing that I wanted to add, I was sharing with Charmaine a story where I had I had interacted with a company that I knew there was fraud happening on their website because I it was a social media platform and I knew it was happening. I reached out to them directly and their response to me was, well, you know, we know you might find that offensive, but we're okay with it. And they let it continue. And it's concerning because to them, it was a, a form of free speech when it was clearly obviously somebody trying to spam somebody. It was somebody pretending to be a famous person and a PR of a famous person trying to get people to reach out to them and contact them. So there's a level of corporate responsibility there too. If you're working for a company and if you're a part of that group that sort of sets that culture, it's important that your responsibility for detecting and stopping this type of stuff and reaches out to your customers as well. Yeah, I, I completely agree with you there, Becky. I think there's a lot more examples surfacing right now. And in the past, I would have said if I went back even to maybe November or December last year, we would have seen a lot of the um, evidence to be really, I guess, antidotal in terms of how criminals are using it. But we certainly know that they are as curious as we are in terms of using it and seeing how far they can go. The leaps and bounds that's happening with generative AI at the moment um, in terms of every few months there's a little bit of a new feature and a new feature and a new feature that we can use with it that's only accelerating their excitement and it's accelerating largely in the issues where it, where it talks to financial crime as an area largely around the deep fakes so we're seeing a lot around images account takeovers um, fake claims trade-based money laundering's come in i think some of you would have seen what came out of the us this week um, around fake passports uh, being used and being used as uh, mechanisms to um, fraught um, elections um, and, and identity type information. We're seeing it being used in instances of copying voice as well um, to hold people to ransom and ask them to make payments. Most certainly social um, engineering type attempts like what you've just said, Becky. We're seeing it around scams, other types of fraud, whether it's email, SMS, um, lots of different opportunities that they are quite honestly looking for anything to make it explicit for them to make a profit-making machine for them. Now, when we're talking about things like, well, how are we going to stop it? Is it so onerous? Can we not stop it? Well, I think on one side of the hand, Maybe we can't exactly stop it. We might always be, you know, a step or two behind. But if we're looking at a lot of the AI principles that are coming in, some of the regulation that's going to come through and what we're seeing around sort of um, other types of, um, I guess, illegal activity being used in this space, it will start to help with how we look at proof points, how we do some fact checking, how do we look at, you know, watermarks on things, how we're protecting IP, um, how we teach and train the models not to give out information about, you know, make a explosive device or how do I copy this to make it look like I look like that celebrity those types of things will certainly come into place and that corporate responsibility is a very very important part about how we develop that amazing yeah and I think that brings us on to our next question which is what are the practical use cases of generative AI and AFC today do you want to take that I'll one Becky yeah I can start with that I some of the things that we've seen and I will say that 
um, a lot of times the financial institutions are a little conservative, especially in the AML space. So if you work in the AML and the anti-money laundering space, then you know you tend to be a bit more conservative because you're the one that has the bullseye on your back. But we are seeing people dabbling in this world a bit. So n most people don't want to be AI first, but they want to be AI ready. So they are they're trying it out without going, you know, full speed ahead, gas foot on the gas pedal. Um, and one of the things that we're seeing is they're using it for their policies and procedures. So they're using that generative AI to help them build out quality policies and procedures behind the scenes. Um, because, you know, having a gap in your policy and procedure is a risk, but not nearly as much of a risk as if you miss 20 criminals or 20 sanctioned individuals or something like that. So they're they're a little more apt to try it on that, that back end first. And we're seeing people build out really robust policies and procedures, keeping them up to date more readily, which is definitely a time saver. Um, and we're also seeing them use it a bit um, within narratives, narratives, excuse me, for SARS and STRs. So working through those narratives, you know, that can be an extremely time consuming process. But if you can have at least a template or a structure or Gen AI that's helping you build that out with your case, uh, that also can help sort of create more efficiencies. Um, and I will share, I just recently spoke to um, a member of the press probably about a month ago that's working with a bank in the U.S. who's actually using that um, for their enhanced due diligence and onboarding. So what they're having it do is go out, get all of the information on that prospective client off of the web, anything that's public, and bringing it back to start their enhanced due diligence, and it's saving them a lot of time. The risk with that is, as humans, we can differentiate if it's good data or not so good data. Um, so there is some risk in there that they need to test, but we are seeing people sort of dip their toe in the water from that perspective. I don't know, Charmaine, if you're seeing something similar, a little different. Yeah, I, I think the biggest sort of instances we're seeing is where you're using um, sort of digital assistants to do sort of that heavy lifting of routine and sort of maintenance um, type tasks. So at Symphony AI, we have Copilot. And our co-pilot is our digital assistant that helps us in multiple areas um, across um, the AML and fraud lifecycle. And the areas that are most practical to use it in, I guess the first point to make before I can talk about practicalities is that generative AI, it's not a silver bullet. It's not going to solve everything. It has very specific use cases that should be used and shouldn't be used in these types of um, instances. And that's simply around how you maximise the capability of it and how do you get the benefit directly off it? And that's why we're, we're, some of these questions really come up as frequently asked questions for us. But if I go into the practicalities, what we're trying to understand is where does it actually prove um, useful, quick, time, timely in order to do something? What's the benefit it's going to do in terms of the impact on um, the process, the end result, or the user who's um, interacting with it? And what's the value of it? And the biggest sort of areas we see is really if you think about like some sort of case management, how do you look at da gather, uh, gathering different parts of um, data, whether it's around, say, a transaction that's come in or is it summarizing some data or something that you've already seen, a document that you might have seen? Is it to use it as um, through an API push that goes and pulls information from the Internet, whether it's through a Google search, because that's where a lot of people would probably do a bit of searching um, externally outside of their company? But it goes a little bit further than that to even summarize the um, case notes for you, to, to look at all the different areas that you're embedding into it and say, that's relevant, that's relevant. Yes, I'd like to build this. I'd like to build this out to a narrative. And to Becky, what you were saying in terms of um, suspicious activity reports or transaction reports, we're seeing those being crafted. And the way that the large language models are learning comes down from the underlying data that you teach it. Um, and it will learn the structure of how you like to actually write uh, a, a SAR report. Um, what kind of information you want to put into it? Does it marry back with good examples of what you've provided it? And here are some really bad examples when you're training it. It learns for that, continually improves across it. But it's not just on that side. It's very interactive, almost like I'm natural language processing. I'm talking and chatting with the um, with a with the digital assistant. Where we're now seeing a lot more use cases where LLMs can be used behind the scenes a little bit further, where it's not so much as obvious to um, a user. So a good example of that would be in the sanction space. So within sanctions, obviously, we've seen a number of different um, formats and messaging types that, that can come through for different um, platforms across the world. Swift is a great example of it. If you think about what's changed with um, ISO 20222 and the move from um, uh, MT to MX messages, they've squashed the number of um, unstructured data fields 
but there's still some of them in there. So as you're getting more other fields coming in and whatever else, you still have to interpret that data. LLMs can be used on that underside to actually look at what that data is in the unstructured way and help you to actually do better um, match accuracy before you come along to understand, you know, let's say is um, is it the country of, um, you know, the Canary Islands or is it somebody named so-and-so Canary or in a suburb called Canary? It's able to actually interpret a lot of that information for you and actually help at the end of, end of that. There's also really practical use cases as well, if I squeeze one more in there, um, really around sure. dynamic risk scoring. And also when it comes to actually triaging um, different types of alerts and things that come through in order to rank them, the highest risk ones get pushed out to actually uh, have individuals look at them versus the lower ones where we know typically nothing really happens off the back of them um, and how you can actually um, either hibernate, dispose, auto-close or park those for a later date. Wow, that was a, that was a comprehensive answer. Um, <laughs> incredibly useful though. Um, so uh, the next question that we have is, what is the best way to explain how AI works in FinCrime to the board, auditors and or financial regulators? Uh, Becky, would you like to kick us off on that one? Absolutely. Um, in order to explain it, you need to understand it yourself. So I think that's the first challenge. And I will tell you, I'm a former regulator. I'm a former chief AML officer. So I've sat on both sides of that and I know how difficult that is. Um, one, you need to understand it yourself. So you have to have those conversations with the vendor that you're using, help them, have them help you understand. It's all about educating. So make sure that they're educating you. You want to educate within your own organization and make sure that your staff understands it. And when you're presenting it to the board or to the regulator, understand, you know, if you work in technology, this is what you think of every day. This is your, this is your job and you're focused on it. When you're working in a financial institution, you're thinking about technology part of the day. You have a lot of other things that are going on. From a regulatory perspective, they're not really focused on technology a lot of times. They're really focused on rules and regulations and things like that. So you have to start out, and I'm not saying to, to make it so basic that it's elementary, but you need to be able to explain to them in a way that here's the technology, here's how it works, perhaps even set up a demo for them and walk through, and this is how this happened. Here's why these alerts happened. Here's why this decision was made. Normally, my staff does ABC, but the technology actually takes that and does sort of that low hanging fruit for me. So this explained to them how that works with an understanding of who your audience is. You're going to talk a little bit differently probably to your vendor than you will to your regulator. So start off with them and say, what, what, how familiar are you with this technology? Do you have a little bit of time that I can sit down with you and I can explain to you how it works, how my staff interacts with it, why we got the results that we did and why we decided what we decided? So it's a lot of what you're doing today, absent the AI. If you don't have that in there, you probably still have to explain the technology, but adding on to that and making sure, starting off with what they might know and really providing them with an education. And frankly, that goes a long way too. And same to your board, whether it's a regulator or a board, your board's not thinking about your technology all day either. So it's a way of sitting down and providing that level of education. Yeah, Charmaine, do you have anything to add to that? I would just echo it's to the board level. It's about explainability. It's about traceability. It's about telling them what, it, what you're using it for, what outcomes you're getting from it and how you're validating that those outcomes are the correct outcomes. If you're talking to your auditors, whether your internal auditors or your external auditors, it's again a bit of an explanation, but it's also a show and tell session, I would say, with them, because for, for them to really understand what you're doing, um, giving them the um, interjection points of how you give it feedback, what type of data have you actually trained it on, um, what the foundation models were actually trained on in the beginning, are you using open source models or are you using proprietary models? A lot of these types of questions are what your auditor wants to be able to evaluate to understand um, how it's been designed how it's being used and therefore the governance of how it's being maintained going forward. Now, a lot of that is also going to be applicable, I would say, to a financial regulator. Now, I'll talk from the perspective of, of what we at Symphony AI talk to regulators about is we explain what the technology is doing. We sit down with them and we show them, we give them a demo. We ask them for feedback as well. If there is certain things that they raise as concerns, we look to see how we immediately address that and roll that back out to the customers who are using our uh, platforms and our technologies and how we consider those things on the innovations going forward. 
those are the things that you as um, an end user customer should also be asking your vendor in order for you to explain to the regulators about how you use it. What governance processes do you have in place? Um, do you have a quality assurance team who is looking at different aspects of it? Who are your data science group that's looking at it? What is your CTO? How are you linking that back into your, uh, your AI strategy for your organisation? And, and how are you part of that bigger sort of way about innovating within your own organisation? So there's a number of different areas that need to be considered. But it all does come back to um, being well understanding, educating yourself about it, maintaining that uh, and really um, discussing it and, and talking about it in the right ways and figuring out if there are any blockages that um, might hinder how you continue to operate with it. Amazing. Um, so one final one before we move on to questions that were asked at registration. Um, it's a classic of the last 12 months. Will AI take my job? <laughs> Can I start? Absolutely. <laughs> Not mine specifically, I should say. But. Um, okay, so my my personal take on this is same with every sort of um, innovation or industrial revolution that's come uh, come along. Not immediately. There's going to be a time frame where we're all getting used to it. We're all understanding it. We're waiting for the regulation to come in. We're waiting for how the principles, you know, get used in different ways. So there's going to be a transition period. At some point, the same way that we've seen it with other types of industries, it will eventually take jobs. But in that process, what we're going to learn and through what Becky was saying before, she talked about, you know, how do you educate people? How do you upskill? We're going to see that a lot of what you do now or how things get done will move into a different area. So the role may change, the skill set you need may change. Um, and we're just going to evolve into what that practice is. There's also been a number of surveys um, done at different institutions, whether they're banking or outside in corporates, and all of them have indicated that AI is going to be used in their organisation. Um, some of the stats I was reading this morning from reports out of surveys done in the end of January were saying, look, we're doing we're doing medium to heavy investment of it into 2024 and 2025, and it's going to be across every different area, um, business function really of um, an organisation. So at some point we are going to see that sort of transition happening, but my take is it's not immediate, it's going to take a little bit of time. Um, but look, stay ahead, do these types of sessions and webinars, be informed and understand what you need to do in order to um, move with the trend. Yep. And I, I will add, I'm I'm old enough that I went through college without email if you can believe that. And and the internet was this brand new thing called Netscape that you really couldn't do anything with. So I, you know, I've gone through that phase of, oh, this internet's gonna take all of our jobs away. Well, it certainly hasn't all these years later. Um, I, and years ago, I was on a webinar where the presenter said, and I wrote it down, I remembered it. He said, there's no limit to greed. And it's very true if you sit and really think about it. No one ever says, oh, you know what? I got enough, I'm done. So there's no limit to greed and there's no replacement for the human brain. And there really isn't. There are things that you all, there will always have to be human intervention for, um, whether it's building out the models or changing the models or explaining the models. So I think there will be a change. And, and I agree with Charmaine. I think that there will be some jobs that do go away, just like in anything else that we've seen. But I think there will be a change in how we do our jobs. So instead of spending all this time doing, you know, one little thing here and there, then perhaps it's a more focused. Now we're spending more time on investigations instead of clearing 5,000 alerts. So I, I think there will be a shift as well. And I don't think it's really anything that we need to worry about. I'm old enough that you can trust me on this. <laughs> <laughs> nice. Um, OK, so now I think is a good time to go on to some audience questions. I have a few that came up on uh, registration and uh, we will endeavour to get to them. I will say that Kevin has already said Netscape. Now you're talking. Uh, so there you go. Becky. <laughs> uh, another Gen Xer out there that totally gets it. <laughs> there you go. Um, so this is a question from Rob. Uh, what are the three key risks to financial crime presented by Gen AI and how can these be mitigated? Charmaine, would you like to kick us off on that one? Yeah, so I guess my, I'm trying to interpret that question to mean, do you mean it as being used by the criminals and, and the risk there, or do you mean it as being uh, financial crime sort of professionals using it? Um, maybe I kind of answer it in, in both ways then, maybe that's the easiest way to do it. Um, I'd say though the top risk if you're a criminal using Gen AI at this point in time, definitely got to be the social engineering side and the fraud that's coming off the back of it. We talked a little bit before in terms of that's almost an FAQ we get a lot in terms of the deep fakes, you know, finding ways to uh, basically exploit um, different banking control vulnerabilities, processes, those types of things, just to wiggle their way through to continue making their profits. 
Um, the second one I would say is they are using it basically to create more noise in the background so they can keep going on with sort of um, concealing any other types of activities they're doing in the background. The criminals are very sophisticated in that way and they will look for any particular means or um, broaden their network or their um, organised crime group, pulling in specialties um, in order to get to the end point of what they want. If I flip that to say, what's the risks of using Gen, I, Gen AI in say a, a thin crime compliance department? I think the first thing is everyone thinks it's a silver bullet. So if I take that analogy, I would say your investigators are gonna over rely on what the Gen AI can do. And so that means they're not gonna focus on like the whole high volume stuff. They're just gonna try to get things done efficiently. Um, you know, you've got to be mindful that Yes, it will look for some of those particular things. You're still going to have to go through and understand what it is actually doing. You're still going to have to QA side of it. You're still going to be able to look for the more complex issues in there. You can mitigate some of those things, because I think that was also part of the question, right, Henry? M mitigation? Uh, yeah, how can these be mitigated? Yeah, so in those types of instances, I would say it's you mitigate through a lot of the responsible AI practices. And I think that's a helpful way to do it. The second risk I would say for fin crime um, professionals would be sort of that loss of human expertise. I think at the moment, the, the more you do a process, the better off you become, the more expertise you get. So, how, so part of that for you is going to be the skills maintenance. How do you maintain your trade craft? And I think that's going to be quite an interesting and relevant point, even down to what's my job or, or those types of things in order to understand how that moves forward. And then I'd say the last one is um, the risk would be probably the depth of an investigation. Um, the Gen AI will prompt you and give you a lot of information there, but it's still up to the human, I'd say, at this point to decide how far um, and how deep they want to actually go and be able to challenge that um, down to what looks right, what doesn't look right. We rely on judgmental and adjudication for a very particular reason. So there's a number of different things in there. And then I guess the only other thing I'd add to mitigation is um, not all AI is designed equal. So when we're considering that, you've got to look at how um, the developers have put guardrails in. What are they doing it? How are they training the models? What data are they using? Those types of things become important in terms of how do you look for that type of um, activity. But let me stop there. Yeah, and I just yeah. have, I think you did a fantastic job, so I don't need to add much to that oh. at all. But I had one thought as you went through um, when we're talking about this, I think a risk that we have is some of our loss of critical thinking skills as a society. So the with the AI, when you mentioned about, you know, you're going to lose some of that that knowledge base and because that practicality from using it all the time, you know, the fact that we aren't as strong with critical thinking as we might have been at one point can create an issue because now you have all this great data, but now you've got to analyze it and you're analyzing it sort of at midpoint instead of starting at the very beginning. And that's kind so, of that depth that I was talking about. Yep. Yep. I agree with you. And it's, and we're losing some of that. We're losing some of that now, even without this. So a good way to mitigate that is to start, you know, again, and you're going to hear me talk about education and training all the time, but educating people and helping them build those, that, those critical thinking muscles as they're going through that investigation, because yet yeah, to your point, Charmaine, that, that depth is, is really a challenge and that can create some issues long-term. Mm. Yeah. That's an I just want to jump into the chat. Uh, we've had a question from Israel. Uh, he says, can you develop the topic of using company sensitive information in your Gen AI prompts? Is in risk to be used as part of training the next version of the LLM? Who owns this data? Mm, who owns the data? So if we're talking about the IP of the models themselves, so if you have in-house written those proprietary models, those models would stay in-house with you. If you're using a third party who's continuing to develop it, that would be the IP of the third party. Um, when it talks to using the data, the data generally would be owned by the organisation. So part of what you need to consider when you are giving LLMs access through APIs and, and other types of connectors to that part of the information is you've got to work out where it comes from. So is it within, say, your domain of um, AML compliance? Are you getting something from, say, the credit department? Because, um, I don't know, the person that you're investigating in this particular case um, has applied for a particular loan and they've submitted a whole pile of information for their company. And now you have a whole pile of extra set of data that you don't have. 
what's the Chinese walls that sit between the different departments? Who owns that data and therefore how um, do you have access to it and how can you retain it? Um, so there's a number of different considerations to be to be thought of in that instance. But that will come down to when we talked, I mentioned a little bit before, um, having um, an AI strategy in place and having some type of AI responsible design. Those types of things would come into what your IT department and what your ethics officers are actually deeming appropriate for your organisation. We are seeing them done a little bit differently across a few different um, uh, banks and institutions. But largely, those are sort of the, the 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 wide sweep that we're seeing across it. Yeah, and your data, if you're a financial institution, your data is your data and shouldn't be, and, and I'm not familiar with any vendors that are doing this where they're taking your data and using it for their purposes and not sharing that with you. I mean, you want to make sure that they're not doing that. But the reality is, is that data belongs to you. So your customer data is yours, whether it's, you know, to Charmaine's point, whether it's your credit data or your AML data. Um, and it's it's being used to train those models, but it's not necessarily being then parsed out to another company. So I don't think I've not seen any concerns where folks are having data breaches or anything along that line. And I, I will say that's one question that has come up that we haven't talked about yet is people are concerned with all this machine learning that their data is more exposed than if they have control of it on their own and the and the computer is not taking comes it. down to when we talk about responsible ai practices is that you don't let your staff go out there and say oh, i'm investigating joe and mary blogs and i'm going to start putting all of their personal information out onto like a chat gtp right that's obviously breaching part of what your company policies are around use of pii data and etc um and that's talking about losing that valuable piece of um an organization's data and what you know about it there's there's going to be boundary lines. And that's why I'm coming back down to understanding what your organization has set up, understanding what um, you give access to the LLM to do. So either proprietary models internally within your organization and only where do you push it out to say do a Google search or you want to go off and uh, pull something off a company's house or a registry data or something like that. And you're doing more of a pull with just and you're, you're, you, you've scoped that out to say it's only on a name and a city and a country basis. So there's ways that you have to define how that operates in your organization. Right. Agreed. Yeah. And it's it's important that you stay within those guidelines for privacy purposes as well. Um, so yeah, I completely agree with you. Right. Yeah. Hopefully that answers both of your questions, Israel and Kevin. Um, and, and continuing on that, for uh, talking about data, what type of crucial or critical data do you need to access in order to implement your AI solutions for the client? And what would be the associated risk with this data? Um, that came in from Eliez. I so before we talk in what I, can I I just want to sort of give an overview that what we're seeing a lot of is that your data needs to be good data and clean data and I know most of us think that we have that but we probably don't and I will tell you that when you start trying to implement any kind of large language model it, you'll learn very quickly that your data is, can be disjointed um, and you'll see that happen a lot especially in in this world in a global market you've got mergers and acquisitions that happen so bank a merge with bank b well bank a connect collects data one way and bank b collects it another way and i'll give you date of birth for example so i worked for a company at one point that was us and uk us does month day year uk does day month year so when you combine that data it gets confused because it's quote unquote backwards in one of the two ways so it's making sure that your data is consistent, that it's clean, that it's clear, that whether it's a merger and acquisition or whether it's the same company and you're just in different geographies and you capture things in different ways um, can create some issues for you when you're trying to run some type of large language model. Um, so I would encourage you, even before we talk about specific data points, your data is probably not as clean as you think it is. Even if you've never gone through any kind of a merger, you, you really want to run that and test that first and make sure you're cleaning up those gaps, making sure that it's consistent, because if you don't, then you will find out really quickly when you implement these, just how, for lack of a better word, wonky <laughs> and disjointed your data can be. Um, I, I don't know, Charmaine, I know you, that you deal with this a lot too. Do, what feedback do you have for us about what some of the data is that's most important? Yeah, so when we're talking about generative AI, we think about how it can use that information to gather information and collate and bring stuff to the surface that normally takes um, a, a large amount of time to do. So if you think about that in, in the FinCrime space, a lot of that's going to be around um, transaction type data. It's going to be around um, 
uh, account is going to be around the customer. All of those types of information, some kind of a, a, a hybrid of what that looks like um, in order for you to increase the, I guess, the data points, the data areas that you can actually tap into. Now, other types of information may be not as crucial. It depends upon what your organization does. And if you're, say, a retail bank operator versus I'm an insurance company or I'm, I'm providing, um, uh, you know, um, transport logistics across, um, you know, shipping vessels. Things like um, data points from mobiles, IP addresses, anything else becomes critical points to help triangulate and bring those data points in into um, what you can see as a whole. It helps to form what that critical sort of look um, necessarily is. And I think that's an important part of what we want to be able to do to help with collating the information, making sure you're bringing the true information um, and accurate information up front, then also being able to triage um, even down to the to perspectives of what would it deem as being low risk or high risk from that information, that is something you can train it on. It needs levels of um, good examples and bad examples in order for it to learn and at, through a repetitive sort of feedback loop in order to understand what's good and what bad at, as it continues to mature in terms of that learning. Brilliant. Um, so uh, moving on, uh, what are the use cases of AI in generating and dispositioning automated AML transaction monitoring alerts? Uh, and that came from Sandy upon registration. Um, go ahead. Do you want to go ahead? No, no, go ahead. I'll just take okay. you through the question. OK, um, the first thing that pops into my mind is uh, basically sort of triaging alerts, for lack of a better word. So. Any of us who work in the financial crime space deal with alerts all the time and false positives. And false positives are probably never going to fully go away, but there's a big difference between I have a thousand false positives and I have 50. Um, there's there's a lot of problems there, especially with an analyst fatigue. If I'm if all I'm doing is clearing alerts and clearing alerts, then I start to miss the important stuff because I'm on alert number 700 and they're all wrong and I just am, don't care anymore because I'm tired. So and that's the reality of it. And so a lot of what this can do, one of the use cases is definitely to sort of hone in and make sure that the alerts are good alerts. And I'll, I'll use the example Charmaine used with us earlier is Canary when you're doing sanctions. So is it Canary Islands? Is it something if all I'm hitting on is Canary, then it could be one, two, three Canary Street. It could be they live in Canary, you know, whatever, Canary, Ontario. They could live in, you know, their their last name could be Canary. So it's you're getting all these false positives because it's just hitting on that word. Whereas with some type of AI, you can actually narrow that down. Is it really the Canary Islands and is it matching up with the person in the Canary Islands or the entity in the Canary Islands? It's not just this, the word, um, or it's some fuzzy matching version of the word. It was slightly misspelled, but it was able to catch it because it could connect all these different data points. So one of the use cases is definitely to help make sure that the alerts that you're getting are actionable. I'm not saying you'll never have a false positive. I'm not saying you'll never miss anything, but it's definitely more actionable alerts for you. And then it can also take some of those low risk alerts. So even if you're doing the actionable ones, you are going to have alerts that are low risk and high. You'll have the ones that come through that look like it could be something very basic, you know, that they, cashed a check that was a little bit higher or a wire that was a little bit higher. And it's not concerning. It's not going to a high-risk jurisdiction, but you have all these other alerts that are high-risk jurisdictions and, you know, known bad actors. You want to get to those first. So it will help you sort of triage those that it might archive those low-level alerts and see if you keep hitting on those later on. Um, because maybe if it hits once, it's not a big deal. If it hits five times, it is. So it can triage those alerts for you so that not only your analysts looking at something that is, actionable, but they're looking at the most egregious or concerning actionable items first. Um, mm -hmm. So that if they do get fatigued, it's the lower end, it's not the high end. So th that I think would probably be one huge use case that we've been seeing pretty frequently. I'm sure Charmaine is familiar with others as well. Yeah, I guess there's also a distinction here to make between where you use AI that's on the predictive side to help you with that and where you use it on the generative side. Because I think sometimes like when we ask a question like that, we just assume AI and we're just like, oh, it must be Gen AI. Well, it's actually probably not. It's probably more on the predictive side. 
So when we use it on the predictive side, that's when we're using it to really identify some of those risk patterns that you're starting to see. So whether it's sort of based on like past cases or whether it's based on things that's found as true suspicion that you have raised up or through some sort of form of unsupervised learning um, with what models you're doing there around um, like risk similarity or um, abnormal behavior um, type models. Um, that helps to actually understand what that is and therefore how do you dispose of that particular item? Do you raise an alert? Do you uh, rate risk rate? Do you put an AI rating onto that alert and say, look, we've seen this 20 times and the way that it's always been closed out is X. We think it's into this low risk bucket. Um, so there's different ways that you can think about it. Um, I think there's also different ways that if you know something is very high um, on an alert and you're seeing multiple points of where it's inflicting across um, other types of examples that have been raised up, um, you might want to automatically push that out to say your level two investigators. You might want to skip level one. And that can also happen within the triaging and the disposition side of it. So there's a number of different ways that the AI can be trained. Um, if you're doing that in-house, it's a lot longer in order to do that training. If you're working with a particular vendor, um, they've already been working on this and testing it and testing it and testing it on different uh, types of uh, data. So you start to see um, a good level of what um, it can actually um, do. The one thing I would also say then is if you're doing um, dispositioning, one thing that we're starting to see um, sort of expand a little bit more on the predictive side at the moment is in topology recognition. And so that's helping to inform what that risk based approach should do. So it might sit there and risk rate and say something like, well, terrorist financing versus um, drug um, layering of money. I'm going to I'm going to push terrorist financing to the top and it might be linked to a particular sanctions case that I'm also seeing on on a, on a different type of um, an alert basis. So there's different ways that you can sit there and look at that. Brilliant. Um... If we very quickly have one uh, time for just one last question, if we can answer very quickly, because I'm conscious that you have a, a final slide prepared for us. But um, another question from Kevin has come in. He says, putting my MLRO hat on for a moment and data quality, the content accuracy and reliability of information held in the UK, EU, US sanctions list is notoriously poor. Missing fields, etc., is the norm. Additionally, the criminal community goes to great efforts to blur their identity and layer their financial activities. However helpful do you really think that generative AI will be in the context of these challenges which have always existed? I'll start with that one. You have about 30 seconds. Oh, OK, <laughs> OK, OK. So this is a case where the Gen AI part's probably the secondary part. You're probably going to want um, a hybrid mix between what your predictive AI can do around um, looking at patterns, um, understanding it, and mixing that in with um, entity resolution. So how do I start looking at the different pieces that I already don't know? That entity resolution is going to also link back to your KYC and CD, CDD port part. Who do I already know? What do I already know about that customer or that business? And I've already filled in the gaps and is it the same person? Am I going to use multiple data points and not rely on fuzzy logic in order to understand who that person is? If I can do all of these pieces together, go out there and use Gen AI to summarise all of this information and help me bring that together. So it's not Gen AI is going to solve it all for you in the first go. It's a bit more of a collaborative way of looking at the technology and utilising what happens across the AML lifecycle to help um, deliver that particular area. Brilliant. Um, we're going to move on to your final slide, which I believe you've prepared. Uh, Israel, with your question, we will take it offline if that's OK. Um, so if you want to take us through the final slide. Yeah, I'll, I'll make a start. I, I guess at the end of all of this is, look, we all want to use the latest technology. We all want to be able to maximise the way that we use, particularly in this instance, generative AI, really in order to minimise the risk that we're doing at the very end of the day. And the key things that Becky and I talked about beforehand and what keeps coming up is start now. If you don't start now, you're almost going to be left a little bit too far behind. When you do try to actually catch up, it will be a lot harder to actually understand what those leaps and jumps have actually been. Uh, the second part, you heard us say it before, upskill and educate. That means yourself, your teams, your C-suite, talking to your IT groups, doing these types of interactive webinars out with the community, out with the professional um, you know, world. The last thing that that links to then is data quality and connectivity. A lot of the AI that we're talking about, particularly on the generative AI side is, it is not going to work if you don't have good data. It's also not gonna work if you don't connect the data and you can't relate the data to anything. So be mindful of that. If I was to give a couple of last points in terms of what do you wanna do in terms of adoption, I would say look for the value centric um, use cases. What's gonna support your um, AML maturity um, in the most 
uh, fastest way for you to actually advance and still be in um, regulatory compliance. And with that goes hand in hand, recognising that value fast. So what's the return on the investment that you're putting in? Whether you're developing it in-house or whether you're buying um, a solution from um, off the shelf or one that's more curated from and out of the box that you're you're really um, diving in and adding your own models to and augmenting, look for what that return on the investment is. That will help to sell the proof points in terms of how do you continue to innovate in this particular area and where you use technology to innovate it. And as a last sort of closing point, look, AI is AI is great. AI helps us, but please try to align it with what you're doing at a company level at your AI strategy and make sure that it is understood and, and sort of um, integrated into what you're doing um, as a business whole. But with that, back to you, Henry. Brilliant. Uh, so that is all from us on today's webinar. I think we're right on time. Uh, our huge thanks to Charmaine Simmons of Symphony AI and Becky Laporte of Datos Insights for answering all of our questions. I think it's been hugely informative and perhaps we'll get to do it again sometime. Uh, we hope you've enjoyed it. And remember that there will be a recording of this session for you to play back in an email in your inbox very soon. Uh, also, please do register for our exciting webinar next week with Symphony AI's Fin Crime and Sanctions Risk and Compliance expert Elizabeth Callan, upping the ante on sanctions compliance, a review of recent US actions. It affects financial institutions globally because if a company conducts any business in the US dollar, then they must comply with US sanctions. Elizabeth will be talking about the latest developments, the implications for companies, and the tools to avoid breaches. You don't want to miss it, and the link to sign up is in the chat right now. Uh, so once again, that's all from us here today. Please do head to symphonyai.com to learn more about all of our AI-led financial crime prevention solutions and contact us if you have any questions at all. Uh, have a very good morning or afternoon or evening, depending on where you are in the world, and we hope to see you again next week. Thank you.